department tell NBC News the pick is, quote, truly stunning, laughable, and insane. Former Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton saying this, quote, it must be the worst nomination for a cabinet position in American history. Gates has sharply criticized the Justice Department for years. This is what he had to say four years ago. Maybe I should serve as Attorney General of the United States. If necessary, I'd fire every little kicker at the J. Edgar Hoover building and send them all packing. Like the president-elect, Gates had also been the subject of investigation by the DOJ. Gates was investigated for sex trafficking, but the case was closed last year without any charges. He has denied any wrongdoing there. Leading us off this hour is NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian, as well as NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Ken, let's start with you. Gates is a pick that is raising eyebrows, not just because of his criticism of the just Justice Department, but also what some critics say is a lack of qualification and also questionable personal behavior in the past. Walk us through what we know about his background as it relates to a job of this stature. Yeah, that's right, Ellison. The Attorney General is not only the top law enforcement officer in the United States, he or she is also holding a really important national security job, privy to some of the most sensitive intelligence, overseeing secret counterintelligence investigations, representing the intelligence community. And Matt Gates just doesn't have the background uh, that people who have held that job have. He's a career politician. He practiced a little bit of law out of law school, but then got elected to the Florida legislature. He's the son of uh, wealthy parents and then got elected to Congress uh, and has been known in Congress as an agent of chaos, as a rhetorical bomb thrower, as someone who tried to take out and did successfully take out uh, the Republican House Speaker. And then you have the issue of these sex trafficking allegations. The Justice Department investigated him, but then decided not to move forward with charges. The House Ethics Committee then took over the investigation and uh, apparently has a report that's ready to go but hasn't been released. And you add all that together and people are very concerned. And then, of course, on top of it, you have his um, are threatening to blow up the Justice Department, accusing the FBI of being unethical and corrupt. Uh, and people inside this building are very, very concerned, Ellison. Julie, talk to me about what you were hearing on Capitol Hill. I understand you have some new reporting related to Matt Gates and Vice President-elect J.D. Vance possibly working together behind the scenes to gauge or gather support. What can you tell us? Yeah, to be clear, Ellison, the calls that they are placing are separate. We're hearing from a number of Senate Republicans who have received such calls separately, again, from Vance and his campaign team, apparently feeling senators out, getting a temperature check, because the uproar, as Ken just said, is not only in his building, it's also in this building, too, among Republicans, greatly. And Vance uh, and Gates himself is also calling around, especially senators on the Judiciary Committee. That will be his first hurdle to cross if he's looking to actually sit atop the Department of Justice. I just had a back and forth with Kevin Kramer, a senator, a Republican senator, about this. He had some really harsh words for Gates. Watch this. I have concerns that he can't get across the finish line and we're going to spend a lot of political capital. I say we, um, you know, a lot of people will spend a lot of political capital on something that even if they got done, you'd have to wonder if it was worth it. But he's got a really steep hill to climb to get lots of votes, including mine. Now, Kramer said he's concerned about the DOJ investigation that ultimately didn't charge him about the sexual misconduct, illicit drug use. All of that is being looked at by the House Ethics Committee and has been for several years. You talked about that report. We do have reporting that they are meeting just to meet uh, tomorrow, that the report could be released if they decide to do it tomorrow as well. There is precedent, though, however, for the committee to release the report on the same day that a member of Congress decides to leave. That's applicable to Gates, of course, who handed in his resignation letter, and that was effective as of noon today. So a lot to watch in this space here, and I'm assuming we're going to hear even more uproar from Republicans as he gets further along. All right, Julie Serkin on Capitol Hill, Ken Delanian at the Department of Justice. Thank you both. As the uproar in Washington grows over the Gates pick, President-elect Trump is moving ahead with transition plans in Florida. The President-elect is behind closed doors at his Mar-a-Lago estate today. He has not announced any new cabinet selections so far. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins us now in studio. Dasha, take us inside of Mar-a-Lago, if you can, in this moment. I mean, these are closed-door meetings, but what do we think is happening? What have you been hearing from sources in the last couple days? Like Game of Thrones, Hunger Games, everyone is jockeying. 
for something. I mean, it is uh, an absolute hive of activity of decision making. And we've been seeing these picks coming out so fast and furious and people making their way down there. Some people even renting places just to be near it all and, and try and either have influence in who is chosen or try and get chosen themselves. And so far, we are seeing in picks like Matt Gates and uh, picks like Tulsi Gabbard, who we'll talk about, uh, even Christine Ellen and others. <laughs> Uh, people who are uh, not only don't have the traditional resumes for those uh, agencies or those roles, but have ha held positions that were actively at odds with what those agencies are supposed to do or what they are doing. And it's just creating this very different dynamic of serious shakeup in Washington as we look ahead to this new administration. Tell us a little more about Tulsi Gabbard, because she served as a congresswoman in the past. She is now the president's pick for director of national intelligence. What does that mean? Why is her background raising some eyebrows amongst people? Well, because this is a massive role. I mean, this is a role that oversees 18 intelligence agencies with a budget of $70 billion. A whole lot of our national intelligence infrastructure goes through the director of national intelligence. She's someone that doesn't have that experience, doesn't have anywhere near the resume of people who have held that role previously. And she too, when we talk about people being at odds, she has been at odds with the national intelligence posture of the United States on many issues. She's been accused of parroting Russian propaganda. Uh, she took a trip to Syria back in 2017 to meet with then President Bashar al-Assad at a time when the United States was in a really frigid relationship with that, uh, with that president and has sort of stepped out of bounds of where the U.S. intelligence community is. So having her step into that role is raising eyebrows from a lot of the people that have been civil servants in that space for a long time, Ellison. Really interesting stuff. Dasha Burns reporting so many details as always. We appreciate it. Thank you. The Israeli and French national soccer teams are meeting today in a high stakes match that has some people on edge. This was the scene earlier tonight. Pro-Palestinian protesters demonstrating about a mile and a half away from the French national stadium. There are 4,000 police officers patrolling the city tonight. NBC News international correspondent Claudio Lavanga is in Paris and joins us now. Claudio, I understand the French president is expected to attend the match this evening. What have you been hearing? What have you been seeing on the ground? Hey, Alison. Well, that uh, game uh, just kicked off about 20 minutes ago. It's still no goals, but it really is not about the score uh, in this game. It is about the security concerns uh, around it, of course. A lot of people stayed away from this stadium uh, because they were afraid that what happened in Amsterdam last week could happen here in Paris uh, tonight. And that's why we just heard from uh, French media that only 13,000 spectators attend are attending this uh, game out of a capacity of 80. Uh, thousand. Now, if you consider uh, that the police, because this was a game of high risk, uh, at high risk uh, of incidents, um, has deployed uh, almost four times uh, the number of police officers that usually patrol or guard a, a sporting event of this kind, uh, 4,000 uh, out of 4,000, 2,500 will be in and around the stadium. Well, that will make it uh, almost one police officer for every, you know, five or six spectators. That's uh, that is a lot. And other police officers will be around the city. Uh, you're actually walking in Paris tonight. You see more police officers than uh, soccer fans. Uh, the tension is still palpable. It's still high. As you mentioned, there was a protest uh, tonight here in Paris, but uh, that was peaceful. Uh, we've just seen them uh, flying uh, Palestinian flags and calling for free Palestine, but there were no clashes with the police so far. But we'll keep monitoring, Elsa. All right. Claudio Lavanga, thank you so much. We appreciate it is time now for today's CNBC Money Minute. Ford is facing a record-setting fine and T-Pain as an unusual guest on his latest